I work for a government agency. I'm always looking for good, enthusiastic men to help us carry out our directives. You're telling me that there is a movie company in Hollywood right now that is funded by the CIA? I think probably Hollywood is full of CIA agents, and we just don't know it. I mean, can you ever really trust another human being? No, the answer is you cannot. Either very smart or incredibly stupid. Test, test, everything's a test, remember? Nothing is what it seems. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the CIA and Hollywood. I am Pierce Redman of PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And I'm Tom Secker of SpyCulture.com. And this is episode six, The CIA and Charlie Wilson's War. All right, so today we're going to be discussing the 2007 film Charlie Wilson's War. Uh, this was directed by Mike Nichols, is written by Aaron Sorkin, and it stars uh, Tom Hanks, uh, Julie Roberts, and Phil Seymour Hoffman, and is a uh, very uh, bizarre and interesting take on the Soviet-Afghan War, and of course um, the CIA's largest, most expensive covert op, uh, Operation Cyclone. Um, and before we, uh, we, we get into this, I'll just say I have a, a slight personal connection with this film, uh, as this was uh, another film, along with uh, The Good Shepherd that we've already talked about, that I ended up seeing when it came out in the movie theater with my uh, father. So a uh, bizarre, you know, a little, little happenstance there. But anyway, joining us today to discuss this film is the one and only Sibel Edmonds. Sibel is, of course, a former FBI whistleblower. She is the founder of BoilingFrogsPost.com and the author of two incredible books, Classified Woman, the Sibel Edmonds story, and the recently released uh, The Lone Gladio, which is a book uh, that me and Tom uh, absolutely love. And um, we've talked with Sibel several times, so it's such a pleasure to have you joining us for this podcast, Sibel. Well, thank you for having me back, and it's going to be really fun and interesting to have this discussion on this god awful movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, so I guess I guess let's get your your sort of overall impressions of the film. Um, you know, what did you what did you think about it? Um, I know we were saying in our emails that uh, you know you had to sort of suffer through it, and certainly I think uh, this movie, unlike most of the films we've chosen uh, in this uh, this first installment of the series, this one is much more straight kind of CIA propaganda. But what were your overall impressions of the film? Well, aside from the film being really awful in terms of how it was made, I would, you know, people, they say, oh, it's a B-grade movie. I think I would give it C. <laughs> uh, in terms of acting and directing and uh, other than, you know, uh, Casey, I mean, the acting, I found it to be really bad. And as and you're right by saying that this one was so straightforward propaganda that that uh, that it I don't think well I don't know maybe because we are among the irate minority I, I just can't see especially after nine eleven mm. how uh, is possible for people to buy into this movie and considering it based on you know facts and based based on you know a true story or even loosely based on true <laughs> story considering how much we we have found out but then again uh, we are talking about the United States. And, uh, and and the mainstream media. And uh, so I guess it won't be surprising um, if we were to find out that most people actually bought into it and that they thought that, hey, this was a pretty solid uh, based on true uh, film story being told. But it was really bad. But aside from that, I would say if I were to simplify, summarize, you know, looking at another movie depicting U.S. war as a fight you know, pitting good freedom fighters versus evil occupiers. In this case, uh, of course, it's it being the evil communist Soviet mm -hmm. Union. And uh, so uh, the, that that is uh, based on what was played in the United States for uh, nearly a decade on Afghanistan, the entire 80s. Uh, so and it goes with what I call official narratives, official lies despite all the facts that we know have poured out since 9-11. Mm. No, absolutely. Um, uh, Tom, do you have any anything quick to say before we uh, we start to break this down? Yeah, sure. I mean, this, to me, it felt like a bit of a, um, a feel-good activist movie, almost like some of those um, alternative media documentaries about, you know, protests and political movements and things like that. The whole movie's tone, to me, seemed... It's quite light-hearted, 
for, for, for a war movie. It was very lighthearted for a war movie. Um, <laughs> but the whole tone seemed to be, you know, we can change the world and we can change it for the better. It's kind of that's like the story they're pretending that they're telling. And while, of course, the Soviet-Afghan war absolutely did change the world irrevocably and in a huge way. Um, and Charlie Wilson was a part of that, I guess. Uh, there's no way that that changed the world for the better. So, yeah. you know, I found this really quite a fundamentally shallow film, a dishonest film. And I think it was probably made by people who were either either lying or they just didn't care whether what they were saying was true or not. I get the impression they were just they wanted to tell this story with that kind of tone and they didn't care whether or not it was particularly accurate. And so these sorts of people would, of course, be the perfect people to be used by the CIA to make a propaganda movie. Um, and as you say, yeah, I agree. This is possibly the most overt and obvious propaganda effort that we've seen so far, if at least if you know what you're looking for. And I suppose mm. they were gambling on the fact that most people wouldn't know what they were looking for. But that's where I'm coming from with it. Yeah. No, a- a- absolutely. And I think uh, Charlie Wilson was probably a pretty shallow and dishonest person. So, you know, <laughs> what, a, what better subject to make a movie about then? <laughs> but um, I guess to to sort of um, to, to look at this as some of the people that are behind this, you know, we've always tried to sort of highlight um, certain individuals that are working on this. And um, there's a couple things that I'd like to just touch on right now. And that's um, first off is George Krill, who is the um, person who wrote the book Charlie Wilson's War. Now, he's a longtime CBS reporter and 60 Minutes producer, so already that should sort of uh, raise some alarm bells. CBS has had a very a long uh, history working with the Central Intelligence Agency. But just a little background on Krill. He graduated from Trinity College in Connecticut and, uh, interestingly, studied at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and later at the Defense Language Institute Foreign Language Center uh, in California. Uh, and I believe, actually, Sabelle, the Defense Language Institute actually uh, appears in the Lone Gladio at one point. Um, Absolutely. And yes. Defense Language Institute uh, was one area I ended up dealing with while I was with the FBI. But after my whistleblowing journey began and after I was fired, it was one of the first places or, or entities to come and try to buy me off and say, <laughs> we have this position for you here, mm. All you have, and it requires uh, clearance, and, uh, but you have to sign a blah, blah document saying that you will not pursue the case you are currently pursuing. Anyhow, please continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, just very interesting that Krill was uh, associated with this. And then um, he later he went on to work um, for the, the Gary Post Tribune, which is a newspaper in Indiana, and then was the Washington editor of Harper's. So he joined CBS in 1976, and he is known as this producer at CBS who made all these, quote, controversial reports dealing um, mostly with national security and international relations, um, a lot of geopolitics. So he focused on Vietnam, Afghanistan, obviously, Cuba, Nicaragua, uh, the violence in Rwanda, Unida in uh, Angola, things like that. And um, for instance, you know, he, in 1976, he made this uh, a film for 60 Minutes, or, or I believe that was actually for CBS at that point, um, the CIA Secret Army, which was about uh, the war against Castro after the Bay of Pigs. In 1982, he made The Uncounted Enemy, a Vietnam deception, which was a 60 Minutes documentary with Mike Wallace. Um, General Westmoreland ended up suing CBS over this, and there's a whole long history about that. But, um... We, and then, and then in the late 80s, uh, he begins researching and reporting on Afghanistan. And presumably this is around when he met Charlie Wilson. And there is at least one picture of them together in uh, either Afghanistan or Pakistan. But what's interesting about Krill is that he seems to be the kind of consummate gatekeeper. Um, every CBS production he does is like 10 years too late. Um, you know, it, it, it's great talking about the CIA trying to kill Castro after the Bay of Pigs, but... 1976, is that really the biggest story? I'm not sure. The same thing with the, the Uncounted Enemy, the, a Vietnam deception. The whole film revolves around the idea that Westmoreland, the, the greatest crime in Vietnam was that Westmoreland was inflating the number of uh, North Vietnamese fighters, that they, you know, he was making it out to be a bigger enemy. Uh, not the secret war in Laos, not the secret war in Cambodia, uh, not the massive drug smuggling operations, um, you know, uh, destroying in, uh, Vietnam through the use of chemical weapons. None of that. Not the uh, Gulf just, of Tonkin uh, either. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Not the Gulf of Tonkin involving uh, numerous people, including the NSA, the CIA, false flag, all that sort of stuff. No, instead it is, uh, oh, that Westmoreland lied about numbers. And and Westmoreland got away with suing them. (laughs) 
So he's a very interesting character um, to be writing a story involving the largest, most expensive covert operation in CIA history. Um, so this is is quite interesting, and and uh, you know, and there's some there's some other stuff about Krill. I'm sure we'll, we'll get to that later on. But keeping in mind that this guy is uh, works for CBS, which has this very long history with the CIA, and he seems to be, uh, what, you know, the sort of classic journalist who sort of. Uh, like a limited hangout. He's allowing you to see some stuff. You know, of course, Westmoreland was lying about troops, but he was also lying about pretty much every single other aspect of Vietnam. Uh, you know, the same thing with uh, most of his stories. So that's interesting. So keep that in mind while we, we're discussing the film. And the uh, the other little interesting thing that I wanted to pick up on were the uh, production companies that were involved in helping to make Charlie Wilson's War. And both of these companies are very interesting um, and they have uh, very suspicious productions under their belt. Now, the first is Relativity Media. This is headed by Ryan Cavanaugh. And this is probably the more conventional company involved in Charlie Wilson's War. They've done, you know, like the Fast and Furious movies, Pineapple Express, Atonement, uh, those sort of big things. But they've also been involved in things like The Kingdom, which had DOD um, assistance. They also produced the same exact year as Charlie Wilson's War, American Gangster. Uh, which is interesting in a movie dealing with Vietnam and dealing with CIA complicity in drug trafficking. They've also, uh, they produce The International, uh, which is about the uh, BCCI scandal, uh, The Born Legacy, The November Man, which is a movie um, starring Pierce Brosnan and deals with NATO Chechen terrorists, Battle of Los Angeles, another DOD movie, Salt, uh, which is something that we will probably be covering next uh, season, uh, and perhaps most importantly, The Social Network. They were one of the companies behind that, another movie that we've already discussed uh, previously on the show. So very interesting. Obviously, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, oh, this is a complete CIA, you know, from top to bottom. But again, the movies that they're uh, involved with in producing, there are definite connections. So it, it would make sense that if they were going to make a movie about the largest covert operation, that they would maybe go to some of these production companies that have some experience. Now, the other company involved is probably the more interesting, and that is Participant Media. And this is um, – they, they have this sort of activist um, mentality to a lot of the films that they make. Um, and, they, you know, the, the films have an agenda. They have a clear message. Um, it is headed by Jeffrey Skoll, who was the first president of eBay. And keep that in mind because it's going to come up in a second. But – some of the movies that Participant uh, Media has been involved in are Good Night and Good Luck, which is dealing with CBS and Robert Murrow, <laughs> uh, Syriana, which is another um, George Clooney movie, um, certainly CIA participation in that, uh, An Inconvenient Truth, Food Inc., Standard Operating Procedure, which is an Errol Morris film about the Abu Ghraib uh, torture scandal, The Cove, um, Contagion is another one, and then it gets a little bit more interesting. We've got the Fifth Estate, which is the uh, movie with Dominic Cumberbatch dealing with WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. The Internet's Own Boy, which is a documentary about Aaron Swartz, who, of course, uh, committed suicide or was suicided. Uh, and perhaps um, even more interesting, um, I know you'll like this, Sibel. They've produced Fair Game, which is a movie all about the Valerie Plame uh, scandal. And perhaps yep. most important, they are the production company behind Citizen Four, the Edward Snowden movie. Um, so, you know, very interesting. The first president of eBay goes on to uh, f form a production company that then produces a film about Citizen Four and about Snowden. And, of course, all those documents are owned by Piero Midiar, who founded eBay. But uh, anyway, so those are the sort of production companies. And I guess we just wanted to sort of highlight that and keep that in mind um, you know, in terms of, of who's involved. But, um, Tom, you wanted to get into, I know, a little bit of the more uh, straightforward CIA um, work that was going on. So why don't you, you pick up there? Well, sure. I mean, the once again, as with most of the films that we've been looking at in this series, it is listed on Chase Brandon's website, the CIA's entertainment liaison in this period. He lists it this on, on his site as one of the films that he worked on. In fact, this is one of the last films that he worked on before he at least officially retired from the CIA. So it's certainly interesting in that sense that this is a guy who was in covert operations in the 70s and 80s. That's what he did for the CIA. I don't think he was ever in Afghanistan. But, you know, one of the last things he did before he retired from the CIA was make this shamefully shallow piece of propaganda about, about the biggest CIA covert operation. 
But apart from Chase Brandon, we also have Milt Bearden, this retired CIA agent who has now turned Hollywood technical advisor. And people will rem- remember him from episode two uh, on Robert De Niro because he was a technical advisor on both Meet the Parents and The Good Shepherd. And the interesting thing about Bearden in particular is that he was actually the CIA station chief in Islamabad in Pakistan from about 86 to 89, I think that's right. So right at the end of the, in the if you like, in the most violent part of this uh, covert operation, in the most violent part of this war, he was there in Islamabad. He was helping to run this operation for the CIA. He was intimately involved. And in fact, Bearden was actually recruited for that role in Islamabad by Gust Avrakatos, um, <laughs> the CIA agent who is supposedly running this whole operation, at least as how it's depicted in the film. So Bearden was right in the middle of this thing. And it's particularly curious that he doesn't appear in the movie. Mm. You know what I'm saying? This is a guy who really should be in this film. He helped to make the film, but he's not in it. And that's something, of, obviously, of a recurring theme with this movie. But we'll get into more of that in a bit. Just a couple of other things I wanted to highlight. Of course, this was... Uh, scripted by Aaron Sorkin. This is a job that Aaron Sorkin went after with a passion. He says this in the Making of documentary. He really pursued this job, writing this story. Um, And this was Sorkin's first movie for years. And he is, of course, a guy who, for a long, long time, uh, had been writing, like, for example, as we mentioned last time, he wrote a special episode of The West Wing for the DOD and the White House. That was actually you know one of the, this is what this guy is about this is what this, this screenwriter is all about so the fact that he went after this project and that he was the guy who actually wrote this movie and that it's a movie that is quite short which is unusual for Sorkin Sorkin generally writes very long scripts yes. um, and this one is so short and that's obviously because they missed out so much of the story even the story from the book itself they're missing out huge reams of that so um yeah, it's just interesting that he was involved in this. Some of the other consultants who also worked on this film, you have the, the author of the original book, you have Joanne Herring, played by Julia Roberts in the movie, who is this super wealthy Texas oil woman who was an <laughs> e- extreme right-wing Christian fundamentalist and also a member of the John Birch Society, interestingly hmm. enough. Um, and uh, Jerry Van Dyke, who was a journalist who covered the Soviet-Afghan war in the 80s, And in 2008, when he was reporting in Afghanistan, he was actually captured by the Taliban and held for 45 days. Uh, He was another advisor on this film, a guy called Colonel Bakuri. That's the only name we have for him, who was an advisor for scenes filmed in Morocco. And it's that's just interesting. I bring that up because so many of these films are filmed in Morocco. It seems that Morocco is extremely happy to have Hollywood filmmakers turn up and pretend that they're in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Yemen or wherever they like. Really, they don't care. You know, it's desert. It's full of Arabs. As long as it looks like that, and then they don't really give a toss. So Morocco seems to be the place to go to if you're going to make that sort of a movie. And just finally, interesting little link up: uh, Harry Humphreys, the former Navy SEAL who is now turned into a military tech advisor. He also worked on this film, and he was one of the many technical advisors on Enemy of the State. So a lot of this does link back to it's the same little network, it's this same cozy little whatever you would call it nexus in Hollywood that seems to be working on a lot of these films. And this film, unsurprisingly, fits right into that. But Pierce, you wanted to move on to the film itself i'm sure by this mm. point. <laughs> well yeah um i guess uh yeah we wanted to get into the film and, and sort of uh, go with what what the film portrays as as the major story and as we were saying this is uh, a movie that it deals much more straightforward with the kind of propaganda and sabelle i wanted to get your take on the the one of the major themes in this movie is that it's this sort of like buddy comedy between gust and Charlie, and uh, you know, they're both sort of introduced as you know, rogue CIA agents, rogue congressmen, um, and in fact, in the making of documentary, uh, Charlie himself refers to Gust as a rogue CIA agent. So, I guess, what was your sort of your take on that idea and and how it's portrayed in this movie? Um, and I know that you know, again, this, this is something that appears in a lot of films, including many of the films that we've chosen for the series. But what was your take on that? Well, of course, that was intentional. Just a cursory look at the backgrounds will 
tell you how false that representation was in the movie, both 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 people's background, and uh, and and you have to. You have to look at the timeline and context of the movie. But before I get to that, I think you made a very good point. Those elements seem to be present in many of these movies, you know, that 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 rogue uh, heroes in the movie, the main characters. I think that a lot of it has to do with the uh, psychological, the state of mind of, of the, uh, the, the the audience, because uh no matter how much uh, CIA made and, and propaganda, they still, most Americans, and I think worldwide as well, uh, to a certain degree, but mainly here is the phenomenon that we see here, we see here in the United States uh, among the audience is they like that rogue elements. Yes. Because otherwise, you know, when you start uh, depicting them as, a, you know, when you start depicting them uh, factually, then you're looking at okay, it's the it's the government. You know, you had the you had the CIA, you had the White House, and the whole thing was plotted. It was intentional to have Charlie Wilson as the face, the the front face of what they were trying to to do, which again goes back to the timeline and context because during that period, you know, the U.S. government needed to step up its Domestic propaganda operations to escalate and uh, and and get more aggressively intervene more aggressively in Afghanistan. During the same time, that holds true for Central America as well, uh, because remember, during this period, still the American people, the majority, because of the still fresh memories of Vietnam War. They have no desire to get involved in more wars and engage in more U.S. foreign intervention. That appetite didn't exist. So they needed to create this appetite. Thus, they did that, uh, a lot of it, through through Raymond in the character, our character, and through uh, Charlie, Charlie Wilson. Mm. And the movie does the opposite, of course. It depicts them... You know, depicts Charlie Wilson as the puppet master, where Charlie Wilson was the front face puppet uh, <laughs> in actuality. So, in order to overcome the war weary public, they had to. This is the deep state. This is the this is the United States government. This is the NATO. They they had to engage in this intensive propaganda and exaggerate this communist Soviet threat. And uh, so they went about selling it to the public, this false notion that the Soviets were on the rise, while in reality, the Soviets were on the decline. Again, anybody who wants to go and check factually what was happening at a time. So the, the movie does actually not only uh, uh, twist things, but actually turns certain facts entirely upside down. And 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 I think it's mainly evident, uh, this is mainly evident with the... Um, with the with the, these two characters, with Charlie Wilson and and Raymond, and that's where we see it the most, and how they are depicted. Mm. Oh no, because absolutely. Who, who is CIA's Raymond? I mean, if you were to step back, look at his background. Okay, factual background, not the not the ones given to the public with the official narratives, the official bio. You're looking at a facilitator shielding the puppet masters. That's that's the rogue element, the the gladio bosses, because you have to do that. I mean, you can't come out and do it as the official face. And uh, let me put it this way: he was one of their psyop men. And and his operation mission was propaganda and changing the public's perception. And to facilitate that, they picked Charlie Wilson. Mm. Oh, no, absolutely. And again, I mean, the movie puts so much emphasis on this obscure congressman who, uh, you know, I mean, the beginning of the movie is him in the fantasy suites in Las Vegas, naked in a hot tub. Um, you know, surrounded by strippers doing cocaine. So this is not who you would immediately, you know, to think that this guy was in charge of this massive secret operation is beyond ridiculous. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know, Tom, did you have anything you wanted to add to this at all um, in terms of this sort of buddy comedy and the, the rogue element uh, that we see in this? Uh, you have Gust, uh, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, and you have Charlie, <laughs> played by Tom Hanks. Um and they, you know, they're sort of bonding over their, you know, love of, frankly, whiskey and women. Um, mm -hmm. And that's very much the portrayal that we're given. And you have them very much portrayed as rogues. You have this, this Philip Seymour Hoffman character, you know, throwing tantrums and breaking windows and doing all of this kind of 
uh, if you like, anti-social, anti-institutional behaviour. He seems like someone that the institution of the CIA is sort of rejecting. He's on the shelf in some way. Whereas, in fact, of course, he, he mentions in the film he was involved in a gladio operation in Greece to overthrow the government in Greece. So this isn't some, you know, just trivial guy who didn't get along with his co-workers who somehow got lumbered with this operation and turned out to be a genius. This is a guy who was clearly put in place because there was a much bigger agenda at play in Afghanistan for the CIA. And this whole portrayal that's it's brought out more in the book maybe than in the film but that like charlie is struggling against the cia and that he's struggling with congress to try and get this money and that there was some kind of resistance to all of this when in fact this was a policy that went back to even before the soviet invasion of afghanistan so all of that's nonsense and just i mean one thing that did occur to me um we were talking about this in the very first episode of this series with animal farm this kind of cia cult of revolution that they're obsessed with portraying the overthrows of governments and, and civil wars and all of that as though these are good things. And this is very much a film that fits into that because you never see, apart from when the Soviets are killing Afghanistan's, uh, Afghans, you never really see them die. Mm -hmm. You never see them die as a result of the CIA's behavior when, of course, thousands upon thousands of Afghans and people from other countries died as part of this war. So they are completely deceiving you about the consequences, the very raw, on-the-ground consequences of this operation and making it seem like, you know, yay, revolution, covert operations, rogue agents, isn't this lovable, isn't this wonderful? <laughs> and mm. yeah, it, it's absolutely not only inaccurate, but also absurd and kind of morally horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, in, indeed, I mean, the end of the movie leaves you with this, well, you know, if only they had gotten, you know, that million dollars to build a school in Kabul, then maybe the Taliban wouldn't have taken over. You know, that's the sort of idea that, that oh, everything else we did is fine. It was only that we dropped the ball like the CIA always does. Oh, damn. Well, don't worry, because, you know, in a, in a decade or so, we'll be back there to, to fix it all up for, uh, for the Afghans. But, um, Tom, you, you picked up on, on something interesting there um, in terms of uh, the sort of struggle that is going on uh, between the CIA and Congress. And, and this is something that um, we haven't seen so much in, in this series, but this is something that is in a lot of CIA assisted movies. Um, the CIA is portrayed as sort of subservient to Congress or something that is just this small government agency. Um, and I mean, Sibel, what can you just like, I don't know, demystify that idea for us? Because um, it, it's so bizarre. And it is one of those things that sort of hits you right in the face that that the CIA needs Congress to fund their budget. I mean, what is the reality of that? <laughs> Oh, what a divine comedy that is. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> well, first, again, going back to the psychology and the mental state of most Americans, it just strengthens this notion of separation of the powers, This our system of checks and balances. No matter what, with every one of these, uh, these uh, establishment, the deep state, the government uh, made movies we see, even with the war scenarios, you, you, the, it, it is always this case where one of the branches is depicted as you know the, the, the engaged in the wrong or maybe morally questionable things. But then you always have the other two branches or at least one other branch that, that, that counters that mm. because they need to keep this false notion alive. Uh, in, uh, within the American people's mind. This is what is, you know, t constantly done in schools, in academic settings, that, yes, we are not, of course, perfect, but, you know, we have this system of checks and balances, which is highly and so falsely promoted here. They... they CIA has never had much problem with the United States Congress and United States Congress and the funding. Uh, at least let me put it this way. Since the late 70s, they haven't. And not only that, with both parties, that being the executive branch and the Congress, not only they have the, the official grant, you know, the funding request. OK, here is the earmark. This is how much is going to go to the CIA for their operations, etc. with Congress. But they have had a secondary way that nobody talks about, which I myself was exposed when I was in the FBI, because some of the fundings of the CIA and their operation comes what we see on the paper, you know, they requested this much, Congress has this hearing, and they say, okay, we'll give you whatever, 8 billion, 15 billion, 20 billion for this year. That's only a certain percentage of the funding they get that they receive from Congress. What happens is the CIA 
has in place in the United States internationally hundreds of NGOs, non-governmental organizations with beautiful, fancy humanitarian uh, names, whether it is the school projects in Afghanistan, Tom, going to your example, or it is the uh, it is some kind of a vaccination program or if it's the birth control education in, in for certain countries uh, or or fighting for the press freedom. I'm talking about NGOs. A lot of these NGOs actually receive uh, direct funding from the United States Congress because they help promote democracy around the world, blah, 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 blah. Well, this is one of the indirect way of funding the CIA operations. For example, when the CIA uh, uses the NGO route and this and the Congress is fully aware of this. That's why you never see anything about some fights Congress withholding or not earmarking certain funds for some of these big NGOs, etc. cetera, is, uh, even though it's supposed to be non-governmental, right? But they get a lot of grants, government grants. And if you look at the numbers, they are huge. Like one, one of many that I got to know firsthand directly was a certain NGO that was supported uh, by the United States Congress, and it was international in nature because it was mainly operated by the Turkish uh, entities, okay, from people from Turkey. And the, 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 in theory, this organization built infrastructures, you know, helped build uh, the wells and the plumbing and the bridges, et cetera, highways, roads in certain Central Asian or Caucasus region, you know, let's say somewhere, I'm just going to throw a name, let's say in Azerbaijan in um, 1999, okay? Well, the money that was earmarked and and was given, granted by Congress to this semi-Turkish NGOs, which is completely under the CIA, actually was used completely. Let's say if you're looking at $50 million, $48 million of it was used to erect about 14, 15 mosques in, in only two year period, which some of those mosques were used because they actually had acreage, okay, and where they were, the the, the, the property where the mosque mosques were located were used as the training ground for uh, for, for Chechens, okay, in, in Azerbaijan. Only out of the fifty million dollars given, let's say, by Congress to this NGO to bring all these great roads and bridges, etc., mm. in Azerbaijan, using some so-called Turkish construction companies, etc., was actually used by the CIA and their Turkish uh, operatives to build mosques and use the ground as training, militaristically training camp for Chechen terrorists. In mid-90s, like in 1995, 1996, again, a lot of money was earmarked by Congress, granted to these NGOs, many of them Turkish, and you would see them as the members members of American Turkish Council, and you see all sorts of deep state entities within American Turkish Council, a multi-billion, a, a very powerful, I would say after APAC, is the second or the third most powerful uh, foreign lobby uh, organization here in the United States. Uh, But it was used in 1996, 1997 uh, to bring in jihadis again from, from, uh, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from other regions to into Turkey, train them militarily, covertly, and given them the false fake passports so they, they would have Turkish passports, and then they would channel them into the Balkan regions during the Balkan com- conflict. Mm. So a lot of these people enter to, you know, fight the, the, the Serbs, etc., with Turkish passports. But, but again, the money, the funding for CIA to run that operation came, part, part of it came through the back channels, meaning earmarking it and giving it these grants to NGOs, uh, both U.S. and international NGOs, which goes directly to the CIA. So that's only one way. I'm not going to even talk about, of course, since 9-11, in addition to these two methods of funding, you know, one of them being the official how much Congress uh, earmarked, you know, the, 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 for the budget for one year for the CIA, then the NGO grants that a lot of it goes to the CIA for black operations. But since 9-11, now we have the secret budgets for secret operations that won't even show up in any documentation. So the public has no right to know because since 9-11, we have made it even easier 
for the CIA to get all these taxpayer uh, sustained funding. So this whole notion promoted in this uh, movie about uh, about oh they depend they have to go there like, like beggars with their hands yes. open so the Congress would grant them some money is ridiculous and even within any significant committee or relevant committee the budget committee etc when there is a rogue congressman or a senator that tries to dig in or maybe stop funding of certain projects the the, the, the response is so quick and they right away back off because. As we know, the FBI, the CIA, they collect files on all these people. So they have huge amount of blackmail material. So if in case they get some rogue congressman or a senator, they have a way of making sure that he gets rehabilitated very quickly <laughs> and back off. Mm. Oh, and, and just, just echoing what you were saying there about NGOs and things, um, you know, of course, in this movie, you, you'd have no idea that that happened. But even in mainstream books, um, I'm thinking of uh, Ahmed Rashid's book, Taliban. He openly talks about the fact that when he was when he was there, that, you know, the, the, that bin Laden himself was getting these sort of USAID grants to build tunnels and bridges all over <laughs> Afghanistan. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is the book that was like the New York Times bestseller at one point. So, you know, these these stories are, are certainly out there. Um but uh, I don't know, Tom, did you want to anything else um, sort of dealing specifically um, with the movie? I mean, of course, we could we could talk about the, uh, the the fact that this this movie that has so much CIA participation in it, uh, there's virtually no mention really of the CIA. I mean, aside from Gust uh, and one a very interesting character, the young uh, chess player, the weapons guy that we see. Um, and that is Michael Vickers, who um, is the only other CIA individual that's named in this movie. And he is, of course, a very uh, prominent uh, deep state actor right now. He's the Undersecretary of Defense Intelligence. Um, he recently revealed that uh, the U.S. has a, a very good working relationship with the Houthis, uh, this force in Yemen that we're uh, you know, supposedly against. And there's lots of um, – Yemen has been called the, uh, you know, the Vietnam of the Middle East – um, by Anwar Sadat, and so obvious allusions to Afghanistan. But interestingly, that guy is also um, is a, a, the actor who plays Michael Vickers in the movie, Christopher Denham, uh, is going to be one of the diplomats in Argo, which is a movie we're going to be discussing after this. But, Tom, do you have anything to say about that? I mean, the idea that the CIA is, is virtually never seen, and I sort of interpreted in this that Charlie is the kind of stand-in for the CIA, especially in the idea that his mistakes are known. So the cocaine the drinking, all of that stuff, his, quote, successes are unknown. Um, and this could be, you know, this sort of the idea that no one really knew who Charlie was until years later. But I don't know, anything to say on that? Well, absolutely. I mean, you've got to remember, the film's called Charlie Wilson's War. It's not <laughs> called the CIA's War, which is, of mm. course, primarily what it was, or even NATO's War or Gladio's War, or whatever, whatever accurate name we could actually put on those real events. No, it's all pinned on Charlie himself. And, and this is kind of the joke about him, is that it's portrayed... As you said at the top, Sibel, it's portrayed like he's the puppet master rather than he's the one being puppeted by the CIA to be the front man for this. So he can go and win the money in Congress and he can distract him by, with all of his scandals with women and cocaine and all the rest of it. Um, it's because, the, cause the, the, I mean, the fact on the ground is Gust was his case officer. This is what he is described as in that History Channel documentary, which is called, is it The Real Charlie Wilson? The True Story of Charlie oh, sorry, Wilson. True Story of Charlie Wilson, there you go. Um, Gust is described as his case officer. And, well, another name for a case officer is a handler. And <laughs> who has a handler? An asset. Which means Charlie Wilson has to have been a CIA asset. That's the bottom line here. And there is no right. way some, you know cowboy James Bond wannabe drunken congressman is going to outmaneuver the CIA in that relationship <laughs> it's just so we've got you it's that's what you've got to bear in mind is that you're right Charlie Wilson is taking the place of the CIA that's why it's called Charlie Wilson's war but that he was actually a CIA asset there isn't a dispute about that that's something that obviously the film doesn't mention at all it avoids the 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 notion of it the whole the way the movie portrays it of course is he's the origin of all this or even Joanne Herring is the origin of all of this whereas that's patently untrue i mean there's documents proving that that's not true so yeah I, I would basically agree with your take on it there and say just to emphasize the fact he was an asset oh yeah absolutely and, and i mean and he's the perfect 
type of asset. He's you know, morally ambiguous. He's compromised in multiple uh, different ways. Mm-hmm. He's a person of moderate authority. So he's the the perfect um, you know asset for the CIA to use, and they can get him out of trouble, and they can use him as the the sort of a front person for this. But um, I think perhaps maybe now we can kind of break down what the film leaves out, which is mm-hmm. probably <laughs> the most important uh, aspect of this. Um, and there are many, many things that this film uh, completely leaves out um, from, yes. the, you know, the biggest sort of elephant in the room is uh, where is Bin Laden, where is Al-Qaeda? <laughs> um, but other things like the, the heroin trade that was flourishing at that time, um, I mean, a million things. But, um, I mean, I don't know, Sibyl, why don't you kind of uh, start this off with us? But, I mean, for instance, I mean, this operation started well before Charlie Wilson ever got involved in this. Um, you know, this was something that started <laughs> under Carter. Um, so I don't know, I mean, if you want to just kind of pick up on that and sort of flesh out, you know, how far back this operation was really going. Well, before I do that, I think there are so many missing uh, crucial facts or cases or names or characters mm-hmm. in this movie that it's hard to, to know where to begin. <laughs> uh, let's say just just take one key figure here that is extremely important, and that is Ahmed Shah Massoud. Yes. Now, he was an Islamist, but not a fanatic, who was a Tajik, uh, Tajik uh, and was not favored by Pakistan's ISI. And, uh, and Pakistan's ISI because they backed the extreme Pashtun elements of the Mujahideen. So then there's this false uh, illusion, uh, impression provided by the U.S., and even uh, indirectly by this movie, that the U.S. support to these Mujahideen fighters went mainly to the Afghan faction that was led by Ahmed Shah Massoud, uh, who's known to be relatively, and I'm emphasizing the word relatively, more relatively more moderate. When in fact, the opposite was true. Uh, the United States didn't like Massoud. In fact, during the 1980s, uh, Charlie Wilson supposedly engineered the appropriation of three and a half billion dollars to help the Afghans fight the Soviets. Well, when you look at the, how much went to Shah Massoud, you see that he received less than 1% of that, mm. less than 1% of that $3.5 billion to help. And uh, again, I was reading, and this was when the movie first came out, uh, maybe even it's in the book, I'm not sure, uh, because I haven't read the book, considering who wrote it, <laughs> that <laughs> Charlie Wilson himself frequently referred to Massoud as the effing Russian collaborator. Mm. OK, while the United States government and even in de- indirectly in this movie, they try to give this appearance that we were actually financing and working with the moderate Mujahideens. And another interesting fact here that that has nothing to do with the movie, really, is that Massoud was assassinated on September 9, 2001. Two days before 9-11 ter- terrorist attacks in the U.S., which we went immediately to Afghanistan. I mean, for anyone to say, oh, yeah, it's just a coincidence. So that's a very important, (laughs) crucial missing link there. Uh, And related to this, we have the missing link of Gulbeddin Hekmatyar. Yes. Here is the founder and active leader of the Hezbe Islami political party. And uh, currently, this political party, this, this Islamic party, is designated as global terrorist by the United States. Well, after escaping from prison in uh, Afghanistan, and this was around early 70s, 72 or 73, uh, Hikmet Yar moved to Pakistan. And when the Soviet war in Afghanistan started in 1979, the CIA began funding this guy rapidly uh, to help him grow this Hezbe Islami Mujahideen organization through the uh, Pakistan's ISI. Well, this guy received nearly 50% of that tr- three and a half plus billion dollars of U.S. money, Charlie Wilson's earmark. Mm. Uh, So you're looking at at least two billion dollars received by this guy. And of course, this doesn't include the amount of money and support he was getting from the Saudis. Uh, Another, again, maybe slightly smaller missing link in terms of characters is the guy Sayaf, uh, Abdul Rasul Sayaf. 
Again, he was heavily funded by the United States and Saudi Arabia. I mean, you're looking at those fanatics. You're looking at the real rapists of the real uh, the, the boys in Afghanistan. You're looking at the groups who were engaged in those brutalities that they are attributing it to the Soviet Union, whether it's the rapes or stoning, stoning people, you know, people, women and murdering people. Uh, and of course, as you mentioned, another huge important uh, activity and the uh, issue here is the heroin issue, the uh, poppies in uh, in Afghanistan, because I don't know if we talked about it during one of our episodes with you, but um, Russians were getting a little bit of that. Of course, the production was not nearly what it is today since 9-11, but uh, it was taking over that multi-billion dollars revenue as well. And that itself, uh, we just brought up the financing of the CIA and these operations. And we talked about, of course, the NGOs, the official earmarks they get. Today is the secret uh, uh, classified funding that nobody should even know about that they get. Add to that all the revenues they obtain through the nefarious illegal activities, one of the top ones being the, uh, being the, the, the heroin. Uh, so, uh, again, that is completely missing, uh, mm-hmm. completely glossed, I mean, completely censured from from this and and so much more. And and again, I think it's interesting in terms of the uh, looking at it from the Gladio aspects of it. Most importantly, I think, in terms of what was happening during the Carter administration is, OK, so the Soviet got out, you know, we even made some deals there. Why all this funding continued? In 1980s and in 1990s. Why? I mean, the funding didn't end. These This partnership, this joint operations between the United States, the CIA, the Gladio, and the Mujahideen, the, the fanatics, these characters did not end after all this. Why? And again, that nobody asks about. And of course, the most obvious missing link is there is no mentioning of the of Bin Laden and uh, and the, all the Saudi figures who played some of the most important roles here in this whole entire scenario, and 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 finally, I I I really have to get everyone's attention to the fact that what what happened to Charlie Wilson himself? As soon as he got out of Congress, he went to work for Pakistan as their lobbyist, yes. and he was making close to half a million dollar a year. Okay, so that's that's who Charlie Wilson, the real <laughs> Charlie Wilson was and is. Uh, so, again, um, the only thing that I, I have a question for you and Tom is this little nugget they put in there with Israel. Mm. Because that kind of little bit stands out. What was their purpose? And, and after you talk about the other missing links that I, I, I most likely skipped or didn't uh, or forgot to mention is why do you think they inserted that little piece of nugget there? Because that's very interesting, I think. I well, like, act- oh, no, go you go ahead, Tom. Uh, all, all I would guess is that they were, if you like, trying to shift some of the responsibility for this, perhaps, and maybe just play into that notion <laughs> of... You know, there's a lot of people who like to think that Israel is secretly pulling the strings on everything, and I find that hard to believe, um, just because they don't even seem to really be able to maintain control of what they consider to be Israel. So the notion of them ruling the entire world just strikes me as <laughs> some, somewhat exaggerated. Um, maybe it's something to do with that, but I think it was just a sort of... Uh, it was also, they, they mentioned in the, feel, in the uh, making of documentary that it's part of this kind of feel-good tone to the movie, that, you know, all these barriers were put aside and old enemies like the Saudis <laughs> and the Pakistanis and the Israelis, they put aside their differences in order to drive the evil godless commies out of Afghanistan, um, which isn't really what happened by any means. There was a lot of very, very subtle and difficult d- diplomacy that went into all of that, and they didn't really put aside their differences at all. But... Yeah, that would be my guess, that it's sort of to try and maintain that tone, maybe a little bit of distraction and deflection from the CIA, because if you throw in Israel, then people will start talking about Israel rather than the CIA. I don't know, something like that. Well, how about you, Pierce? Oh, well, I actually I actually kind of see it as a, a maybe slightly more nefarious, because in a lot of CIA productions, uh, Israel does come up. Um, we, we've seen that in Homeland, where we had this rogue Mossad agent that was, you know, spying on people and working against the CIA. Um, and I think many times they're they're willing to sort of put them out on a limb. And I think part of that is 
uh, the conspiracy culture that sort of gloms on to anything dealing with Mossad or Israel. And again, sort of a little bit of a deflection, a little bit of a, you know, um, you know, look over there. But I think the CIA is also willing. I don't think the CIA, uh, like in reality with all uh, intelligence agencies, no, no intelligence agencies are really friends with each other. I don't really think the CIA and the Mossad get along uh, all that well on everything. Um, and I think that's a little bit of the kind of like, okay, you know, we'll, will attack you. It was really interesting only because, again, um, you would never think that. And then, you know, what else is going on with Israel and weapons trafficking in that time period is Iran-Contra. So uh, very interesting that they mention it. Um, and, yep. uh, yeah. Because <clears throat> for people who want to look at it from like a slightly different angle, though, one factual thing, which I don't believe that that's, that was their points. Obviously, they glossed over it because it doesn't really stand up. It's kind of, it kind of is in passing, as if it's in passing. Is uh, the 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 maintain the maintenance of appearances, and that is, let's say, even with Pakistan, it was well, sure, we will, but I can't look like this is the the president mm-hmm. at the time. I can't look like as if I'm cooperating. Uh, so publicly, I have to always maintain my my appearance that I. I am mm-hmm. not pro-Israel. I would never, ever, ever do anything jointly with with Israel, which again uh, spills over into Saudi Arabia, because the same thing absolutely is true with Saudi Arabia. While Saudi Arabia is an active participant partner on in in many of these operations, Gladio operations involving that part of the world, uh, but also the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel. That and that is the ruling families, the 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 monarch there, people. Well, actually, we are the rulers of Saudi Arabia, but through them, uh, is is the the real partnership and and cozy relationship between Saudi Arabia, the 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 rulers and the, our puppets and the Israeli regime. But with a lot of things, the Saudis do exactly the same things. They have to maintain that pretense that. Oh, we don't be. We despise. We actually funding terrorists or whatever, or or freedom fighters against Israel. Where in fact, this is not the case. They just have to maintain appearances. But interestingly, when you go to a horrible movie with this person who is so part of Operation Gladio, is Robert Baer and the Syriana movie. Mm. With all the focus on Saudi Arabia, there is not really any mentioning of Israel in that regard. Because they depict it as, okay, they are lifelong enemies there, including the ruling families. And so that, that to me is such an interesting thing, dynamic seeing, especially comparing the two movies and, uh, and knowing who real, really he is, uh, Robert Baer. And then having this little nugget that they put in there, which I'm sure not many people really paid much attention because that was the intention. But just, I guess, depends on how you look and how much further you want to dig on that and the implications of it in general. Because the same thing applies with the Turkish, uh, now currently Turkish president, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Erdogan and and Israel. There needs to be this tough talk about Israel, you know, and some of these gestures, both parties, meaning Israel and Turkey, knowing that that has to exist for the leader to maintain power, the leader who happens to be liked and supported by Israel. And then behind the scenes, I mean, it is the, the opposite is true. Mm. Oh no, no, absolutely, and I mean, I it, it was a, it is a curious moment in the film, um, and and definitely something that you could you know only imagine some CIA you know Milt Bearden or Chase Brandon telling you know Sorkin, why don't you just throw that in there? You know that, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, I don't know, Tom, did you have any anything else um, dealing with that, or um, you know kind of fleshing out some of the other things that the the film leaves out and in that term you know what what are they trying to do with that you know how are they trying to craft this narrative well i think they're trying to to minimize it i think they're trying to make it seem as i said at the top i mean we don't have a huge amount of time left but uh, (laughs) as i said at the top this is kind of like a feel-good activist movie this is a movie saying you know look these two guys they managed to change the world with the help of you know several billion dollars from congress and quite a lot of other things going on but leave those aside don't worry about them it's about these two guys and they managed to change the world and isn't it great that they defeated communism and uh, i mean the whole notion that two people could have or even just that the whole soviet afghan war is what defeated Mm. the soviet union is kind of a joke 
Um, it was already rotting from within a decade earlier before that war even started. But you have things like, just to pick up on um, who you mentioned before, Sibel, this guy, Gulbin and Hekmatyar, who received the majority, um, or at least the largest share of this CIA weapons trafficking that was going on to, to support the Mujahideen. His gang got more support than anyone else did. And this is a guy who was trafficking in, in narcotics. This is a guy who was killing moderate Afghans in Afghanistan. He was killing people who didn't believe in his you know, wild extremist fanaticism. He was someone who has a reputation for skinning people alive. Um, mm-hmm. he, he was an absolute psychopath. He was like one of the worst human beings imaginable. He does not appear in the movie. And you might say, well, okay, but obviously they're not going to put someone like that in the movie. But the thing is, he met Charlie Wilson and Joanne Herring. In fact, Joanne Herring made a documentary about him. At the very start of the movie, you remember she holds this party where she's showing a film about Afghanistan? Right. That film is about Hekmatia. She went and met him, and she was so charmed by this psychopath that she thought, this is wonderful, he's a freedom fighter, I've got to make a film about this. He's actually the whole reason why, or not the whole reason, but one of the main reasons why she got involved, and therefore why Charlie Wilson got involved in this. And yet he is absent completely from the film. And so you've got to wonder at that, as to, yeah, what, you ask me, what are they trying to do here? I think they're just trying to compress this down into the smallest, most trivial story they possibly can, while still maintaining that, you know, yay, isn't this great, isn't these wonderful, lovable rogues who changed the world, isn't all this fantastic? And just reduce it to that and avoid the myriad other issues going on here. Um, yeah, I mean, another thing just to, that I think is important to, to emphasize is that the purpose of the war, the, the purpose or at least of the American involvement, the CIA and NATO involvement in this war, is very much portrayed as, you know, liberating Afghanistan. It's very much the old myth of, you know, freedom fighters and, you know, fighting back against the the horrible occupying Russians, when in fact, as Brzezinski himself, the big new Brzezinski himself said, the purpose was not to liberate Afghanistan, the purpose was to make the Soviets bleed for as much and as long as is possible. Those are his words. And that isn't mm. really portrayed in this film. They, they very much portray, you know, the Afghans as these, you know, brave heroic fighters, not just as, whereas in reality, the CIA, they just saw them as cannon fodder. They just saw mm. them as willing willing to go and sacrifice themselves to make the Soviets bleed. And to the CIA, that sounded wonderful. But that is very much not the portrayal you get in this movie. So the whole dynamic of what was really going on there has been turned on its head to make it seem like, basically to make it seem like a much more positive story. And, but the, <laughs> even that's kind of strange, because like you say, they almost write the CIA out of the script. So why are they even, you know, why would they even bother? It's like they're minimizing their own role, but glorifying what actually, you know, the consequences of this and everything and trying to turn it into a fantastic story for themselves when they're not even really in the story. It's a very odd thing for them to be doing there, um, mm. I have to admit. I suppose we started off saying this was actually one of the more obvious examples of propaganda, but how it exactly is working is a bit more complicated. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. And I mean, just just picking up on that, um, another character that is worth mentioning that is completely left out of this movie is Jalaluddin Haqqani, who, along with uh, Hekmatar, was the the other uh, individual who was getting probably the most money. And this is Haqqani was this, uh, he, of course, runs the Haqqani Network or founded the Haqqani Network right now, but was a good friend of Charlie. And uh, Charlie Wilson uh, referred to him as goodness personified. He um, protected Charlie whenever he went into Afghanistan. And uh, after 9-11, when Haqqani was placed as the number three most wanted person, um, you know, the, the FBI list, Charlie Wilson was asked about this, and he said, no, oh, that did give me pause for thought. But Haqqani took care of me, and I'll never forget that. I'd love to see him again. I would try to persuade him that the Taliban was a force for destruction, which he definitely wasn't. So again, this, this drug trafficking warlord, um, who is accredited with introducing suicide bombing to Afghanistan, a culture that never previously used that. Uh, he's goodness personified. But um, I guess to kind of uh, to, to sort of round off this whole conversation, um, so Bill, I think w- one of the major things that's going on in this movie uh, and what the CIA uh, is trying to do, and this is something we've seen uh, certainly with the social network, the movie we dealt with previously, was that this story was going to come out at some point, obviously, um, and that they kind of wanted to. And I think the context of when this movie came out, uh, 2007, so we've still got the, the sort of Bush neocon cabal is still in power. And I think that that is one of the more interesting aspects that's left out is the neocon influence and the sort of neocon takeover that was going on. So again, I mean, 
during Operation Cyclone? Who's deputy director of the, the CIA? Robert Gates. Um, who was deputy director of the CIA uh, under Carter and then later secretary of defense under uh, Reagan, Frank Carlucci, who then went on to work at PNAC and the Carlyle Group and all these things. And I don't know, I just wanted to get your take on that, Sibel. I mean, this sort of, you know, the, again, what they're not talking about and, and this sort of neocon takeover and, and ultimately that this movie is sort of leaving out the, that, that the beginnings of what Gladio B would become. So I don't know, just your take on that. Well, as as to be expected, as with so many of the other movies that that you mentioned uh, during this introduction for for this episode, uh, the other thing also to consider is, I mean, you just said two thousand seven, and I guess we can look at it two ways because um, one is that first of all, the impression was kind of given there, so kind of in a light way, uh, not not emphasize that's true and uh, the other thing is well look at charlie wilson what party which party did he belong to mm. democrats <laughs> right and then when you actually see the portrayal of both characters joanne and him i mean with him even with the you know the the the, the cocaine and sex mm. parties and everything uh i believe a lot of people on the left would consider that really he was a progressive man <laughs> Yes, mm-hmm. <laughs> because as you know, the word progressive is defined uh, in in differently by different people. Uh, but it, it was not portrayed in in this way that uh, people in the left would consider. Oh my God, what what a disgusting, slimy kind of a guy. But if you look at the way she's portrayed, I think you will see the difference because. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is one of the things you find as a common thread between um, all these movies that you mentioned, and it applies to this movie as well. Because if you look at those people that you name, other people in these companies within um, who run in, in Hollywood and and produce these movies, the executive producers, the production companies, you know that in general they they always, almost always, fund the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. And they always fund the Democrat presidency, you know. The, so that that kind of a thing actually exists and has existed in Hollywood. And I don't know if you disagree with me or not. So yeah. I think, yeah. So you think they were not wanting to give credit to the neocons? And that's why they, did, they didn't want to give him any of the credit for this wonderful world changing story. Absolutely. And Charlie Wilson is who? He's a Democrat. Yeah, yeah sure. He's and, a Democrat. And, yeah. And, and, and in fact, it had some of those left's elements in that, the kinds of things that makes the left's uh, heart kind of uh, ache with, with, with the humanitarian angle. And we were doing there for the good cause and mm-hmm. the democracy and all those kinds of things. So I think that that was the purpose, possibly. Again, that, that's the matter of opinion. But... Um, you um, you look at all these movies and you would see in terms of the partisanship, which we know that the two sides of the same coin we are talking about, is, is always favorable towards the left. And Pierce, you, I believe, brought up this whole thing of, well, this going back even to back to Carter administration's mm-hmm. period, which, again, brings up this whole notion uh, and, and saying that, well, did it start with Reagan uh, bleeding the Soviet and, and these operations, or did it start long before that, years before that? And then we are looking at, of course, uh, Carter administration as well. So that that is another element to consider. I, I actually think that's a really uh, something that I didn't even think about until you're mentioning it. But the, um, I, you know, and again, I mean, 2007, just before, you know, Obama and the whole hope and change kind of stuff. And Aaron Sorkin is like a hardcore Democrat and donates a massive amount of money. I mean, obviously the West wing is like his sort of democratic wet dream for how an administration <laughs> should be run. Um, so no, sure. sure. And, actually... and, and the newsroom as well, his latest mm-hmm. series, which is, which is very kind of uh, lefty, but at the same time, mm-hmm. ultimately extremely hawkish on the war on terror, as is this film in a way they're, they're you know, he's a lefty, but he's a humanitarian hawk, if you like. Mm. Um, Mm. And yeah, and Charlie Wilson fits in in much the same. So you can see why Aaron Sorkin would want to write this story about Charlie Wilson. He does fit in with his kind of, you know, desired image of America, I'd say. Right. No, absolutely. I think that's uh, excellent. Yeah, and again, I mean, and it sort of excuses the excesses of uh, 
the, the, the you know liberals in the 80s and oh sure yeah was he you know i mean i mean he calls one of his secretaries jailbait i mean he's like a booze hound you know cokehead sex freak is this someone that we should really be looking up to oh yeah of course because he, he defeated those evil russians and uh you know oh tom hanks is funny isn't he <laughs> <laughs> True. I mean, even though it's not done in a slime as, as, you know, at this level of sliminess, but if you look at most of the heroes in the action adventure movies or the spy thrillers, etc., I mean, what do you really see? You are looking at the guys who are very good in poker and they gamble and they are drinkers. You know, they love their martinis, whether it's James Wan, and, and, and they are, they are the, uh, the, the studs. They are going out there and they are, you know, they're screwing women right and left and they are beautiful tall woman and most of them have kind of little small bug brain bug <laughs> brains but but that that's another element actually present so I think unfortunately that still is not as much maybe you know to some people with more um, feministic point of view the real feministic point of view would, would become as something oh repulsive but unfortunately uh, you would find so many people again I'm saying unfortunately who think that's cool <laughs> Yeah. yeah. They think that's cool. I mean, you tell me how many guys in the United States wouldn't want to be in a hot tub with three gorgeous plague boy mm-hmm. women, you know, uh, and, and drinking martinis and, and, and having that, that situation and participating in that. I mean, you're also looking at, at, at that aspect and say, yeah, you know, um, yet, you know, the, with, with Joanne, for example, some of this hypocrisy is illustrated. You know, she, yeah, she's screwing around and all these things, but she's a right winger. You know, she's wearing the cross. <laughs> and the way she's depicted, I think you see a big difference. And unfortunately, within our own society, you see different reaction to both characters. Hmm. It's more ridiculous, her character. It, 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 they, it's made that you can see the hypocrisy and the ridiculousness of it, the character. Hmm. Yet the way it's framed and it is presented, despite that factual sliminess, is not nearly at that level when they are depicting uh, uh, Charlie Wilson's character now. And of course, you know, he has revelation moments. You know, he's arriving there and he's looking hot and sweaty and these refugees. Yes. Oh, my God, that was just so nauseating. I was mm. uh, I'm glad I had not eaten right before watching that <laughs> that that movie because it was just so nauseating. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, and 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 you know maybe that's a a, a good way to sort of you know kind of close down the conversation. But again, you're just saying, Sabelle, you know, oh, who wouldn't want to be in this situation? And and in many ways, this movie is very you know, if Charlie is the sort of stand-in for the CIA, then join the CIA. You know, you might yeah. be in a hot tub with beautiful women. You'll travel mm. around the world. You'll have tons of uh, you know wonderful anonymous sex and you know no <laughs> repercussions whatsoever. So. In, in many ways, it is um, one of the more sort of overtly positive portrayals and positive recruitment films for um, the, the CIA, as opposed to many of the other movies we've dealt with, which are more sort of dark and mysterious CIA. But I don't know, Tom, do you want any, any kind of final thoughts, anything you wanted to add to this? Well, just that this is the – there is an extreme moral ambiguity in the film that I think Sibel just nailed there, mm. is that you have this guy who's sort of a progressive, but he's also a hawk. He's sort of, you know, supposed to be a liberal, but he doesn't seem to have any respect for women. Um, and yet, of course, because he's like a, because he's good time Charlie, because he thinks he's James Bond, we're supposed to look up to him. And yeah, I suppose even whether he's supposed to be a direct stand in for the CIA or not, the fact is he was a CIA asset. And the fact is he did have some kind of weird James Bond complex. He, you know, he was riding around Afghanistan on horseback and firing machine guns off into the distance mm-hmm. and all kinds of silly things. He was a, you know, the guy was a bit of an idiot, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, and I suppose that's the, that's the takeaway message, I would say, is that they're calling it Charlie Wilson's war, but Charlie Wilson was an idiot and a CIA asset. This was the CIA's <laughs> war. And if this film was even remotely honest, that's what it would be called. And the fact that it isn't called that means that it isn't remotely honest. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's how I'm going to try and sum this one up. Oh, excellent. Um, Sabelle, do you have any final thoughts as well? No, absolutely. I second Tom on that. And, um, hey, Tom Hanks is used to playing idiots, you know. He had the... <laughs> You know, Forrest Gump, I know it was a darling character, but he's good at it. Or maybe he's an idiot, but you're absolutely right, Tom. Mm. He has plenty of practice as an actor to play idiots, and, and he played a good one <laughs> with this one. In that respect, at least that part of the character shines through, at least for us. <laughs> well, well, definitely. Well, excellent. Well, um, uh, Sabelle, thank you so much for joining us um, on this, this penultimate episode of the first season of The CIA in Hollywood. 
Um, once again, uh, I just want to tell the listeners to please go to boilingfrogspost.com. Uh, it's an amazing website. Sabelle has, uh, has a new podcast that's just fantastic right now uh, and lots more things going on there. And, of course, please um, you know, try and pick up a copy of The Lone Gladio. Uh, it deals with a lot of – if you really want to know what's going on and, and all the, the sort of things that we've been talking about, that is such an excellent um, you know, opener for all of that. So, Sabelle, thank you so much for joining us. Many thanks to both of you. Uh, It's a pleasure always discussing these issues or similar issues with you. And and keep up this good work. I think it's extremely important, significant what you're doing because a lot of people talk about mainstream media, uh, et cetera, out there. But not many people are covering this important aspects of uh, PSYOP and propaganda. uh, and, And basically one of the things that, again, has led us to be where we are today and that is the Hollywood and the movie industry. And, and amazingly, the most people uh, get their knowledge through these types of movies. They form this, uh, these, uh, these uh, pseudo false realities based on what is depicted, especially when they are marketed as based on true story. So I think what you're doing is so important. And, and it was a great idea to start this series. And I'm thankful that you invited me. Well, excellent. And uh, Tom, do you want to just uh, tell the listeners what to expect for our next episode? Well, of course, in the next episode, we're going to be looking at a very similar film in a lot of ways. The Oscar winning 2012 film Argo, which involves Ben Affleck, George Clooney and Grant Heslov, which is an interesting little nexus that we're going to be discussing. And it's very, very similar to Charlie Wilson's War in as much as it is another retelling of CIA history. And I suppose very similar to The Good Shepherd in that respect as well. Um, But this one is also from the same period as Charlie Wilson's War, because we're talking about the uh, the early 1980s in Iran and the hostage crisis there. So yes, next time on uh, the penul- uh, the sorry not the penultimate the very <laughs> final episode of this season, we will be talking about Argo. So obviously stay tuned for that. But yeah, thank you, Pierce, and thank you, Sabelle. This has been another fascinating discussion. So I'm, I'm very grateful to both of you for contributing and uh, and being part of this. And to all of you listening, thank you for listening. And like I say, join us again soon for the very final episode of this season of the CIA and Hollywood.